Welcome to week 8, your first immersion into HTML. This should be something that a lot of you are already familiar with. You may have right clicked on a web page and clicked view page source, or you may have been familiar with some sort of HTML since you were young, but if you're not familiar with it, hopefully the lecture made you more familiar with it. The to do is listed in the readme file here. It walks you through the implementation details that you'll also find on your lab 8 over in this section here. There's several parts to this, none of which are too hard. So instead of typing out the code line by line, I'm going to do a little copy and pasting from two different codes that I did, and I'm going to explain them line by line so I can get more information into one video. When we talk about code and we talk about the unlimited ways to code something, HTML is really going to be one of your first opportunities to see how many options there are on getting something done and that's true with JavaScript as well you don't have to take a single input you don't have to use a single way to do these things so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over the two options that I have I'm going to paste these in here so that you can see them and as we do that I'm going to be going over them so that you can have a better understanding of what options are available to you now there's a couple ways you could go about doing this you actually could go down and you could format your multiple choice answers first the reason that's not going to make so much sense is that when we're using Java and creating buttons and changing colors and things like that, we need to first set identifiers. So you should have an idea of what your multiple choice and your free response questions are, but I wouldn't necessarily go ahead and put them in there before you've pre-programmed your code in here. So the first script that we're going to use is one that I've written here. What this function is going to do is pretty simple here. You see that it says check answers right here and creates a button. The variable is answers, the button is get attribute, and I named it data answer because we're going to have two types of answers here. We're going to have a data answer and we're going to have a free text answer. Now you don't have to name it data answer, that's just what I'm calling it. You could call it mc-answer for multiple choice dash answer. You could call it multiple choice dash answer. So we're naming the variable there that we're going to recall later. Now we have the response, get element ID response. So the document here, you're going to see that come back up later. So if an answer is correct, we change the color to green, and we change the inner HTML to correct. The response style color is green. That can be changed. I went with green because that seemed to be what we were kind of doing here. Else, you can see that you don't have to put if answer is not correct, because if it isn't correct, there's only one other option. It's wrong, right? So else button style background red response and inner HTML is incorrect and the color of that text is then red then we create a function check text answers so we have variable input document get element ID this is the text answer again the get element ID makes sense once we get to it then we have get element ID text response and input value now text answer is what I'm using for the free answer right so whatever the person types in should be correct the answer to the first one is 42. You'll see that in a second as to why. And that will appear as green. The button will light up green. The words will light up green and it will say correct. If it is not 42, then the answer will be red. It will say incorrect in red. Now, if you weren't using a number response for your free choice question, you may have to add some additional logic where you make the response too lower or too upper or whatever the case is. Because if someone has stylistic writing, capital or lowercase, you want to first reduce those to a common answer and then check it against what the actual answer is. So you would write your answer, what's the largest mammal in the world? The answer would be all lowercase blue whale. But if someone typed in capital B on blue and capital W on whale, then you would want to reduce both of those, the B and the W down to lowercase and check that against the blue whale that you have in there as the answer. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, when we're getting into the questions now, we've already developed the inputs on these. We have data answer for the multiple choice and we have text answer for the free text. We've also created the get element ID, which we named response as a variable, and we have the get attribute, which we named answer. So that's gonna make a little more sense once we get this programmed in. So let's code our questions here for our multiple choice. Now I used H3 because as you recall in the readme file, it asked you to use an H3 header. So that's what we're using for our questions here. And the question is who may have said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. This is a real quote from someone who actually was really important and believed that there was only a market for five computers. 
Now, whether or not they meant five types of computers or five brands of computers is not really relevant. It's just kind of an interesting tech question. So we have answers here. We have Vice President Al Gore, Bill Gates, IBM Chairman Tom Watson, and Hewlett Packard co-founder David Picard. Now you may recognize the name Watson because IBM famously named their all-thinking computer Watson. That would be after IBM Chairman Thomas Watson. And you can see here that the answers have been labeled incorrect, incorrect, correct, and incorrect. So if you did not know, IBM Chairman Thomas Watson is the one who had that famous quote. Now what these do is we have data answers here. We've named them data answers, right? Our multiple choice or MC answers, whatever you name them. We've told them that it's incorrect. And then on click, when the button is clicked, we're going to check the answer and we already know that we've given it the proper response for that. So the ID here is called response. We saw that up here earlier in the variable response and in the variable answer. So when we're getting element ID, getting attribute, data answer from response, then we come back down here and we see data answer from response, right? So that's how the JavaScript is tying to the buttons that we've created. Now we need to move on to our free answer section. So here we're going to put our next portion, and it's going to be part two free response. What is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything? For any Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans or any other fellow nerds out there, that answer is 42. Now we put that answer up above here. So you see when it checks the function of the input response of the answer of the text answer, right? Because we have the multiple choice questions here. So when it checks the text answer, the only correct answer is 42. Now, if you wanted to be more comprehensive, you could actually put in quotes or 42, spell it out, or is like 40-2, something like that. We're just going to go right now to get this code done, to get a little bit of coding under our belt as the answer being 42. So when you answer the free response question we have input type is text ID is text answer that's our free answer on click check text answer and the div ID is text response which going back up here you see we have our get element ID is text response and our get element ID is text answer so now that we have those in there the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run it HTTP dash server and we're gonna open this link here and we're gonna click on the index right here so our first part here, multiple choice, who said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Uh, Internet Vice President Al Gore, no. Bill Gates, no. Co-founder David Packard, no. IBM Chairman David Watson turns green, and you see that the text turns green as well. Now, it would take additional coding to unclick these red answers and set them back to their original color. However, it did not ask us to do that. So in the interest of getting this done and getting you immersed in some HTML, I have not included the additional coding to return these to their original color. But that is something you could add if you wanted to do so. Now when you go to our free answer here, and we type in what is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, we say seven. Red, incorrect. We say uh, divinity. Incorrect still. Now if we go back and we put in 42, you'll see that as asked, the box turns green, and the word correct appears below it in green. Wasn't asked. I kind of felt it was implied, so that's how I went about doing it. This actually accomplishes the code. Now we're going to show you another quick second way to do this. So give me a second. We're going to reset all of this. All right, so we're all reset now. We're going to put in a different code this time. This code is going to be a bit longer, where we have the correct answer as the longest railroad. We've got constant buttons, get element ID buttons, so we're creating buttons in this one. Now this one's going to go back to some stuff that not a lot of people love. For let i equal to zero when i is less than buttons.length i plus plus. And we're going to add event listeners, click. So now the computer is listening for when you have a mouse click on it, right? And we're going to have the requested colors here. We're going to change the background color to green. We have in insert adjacent HTML, so before the end we have correct, before the end we have incorrect if the answer is wrong. Then we have submit button. This is for our typed out answer. User answer and their value. Hashtag second question. If the answer is Canberra, then it's green. Otherwise, it's red. So in this one, we've created a similar thing using if else loops. We've just used buttons in a completely different way, but they should accomplish the same thing. 
Now, the other thing that we have to do here is now we have to update our multiple choice questions. So our multiple choice are not going to be the same because what we did on this one is we actually created buttons. So for multiple choice questions here, even though the code up top is longer, the code down here should probably be a little bit more simple. And now what we've done is we've created button one, button two, button three, and button four, but we've already put the answer that the longest railroad is correct. So we're not doing an incorrect correct like we did on the previous code where you've told the computer what the correct answer is up here above and it knows that when the right button with the longest railroad is clicked then it turns green. Otherwise it's going to turn red and say that it's incorrect. So in creating buttons you can accomplish less code in the HTML at the cost of perhaps some more code in the JavaScript. And then on the second one here all we have to do is input this. I'm going to pop that in there. What is the capital of Australia? Now again, in this particular item, to be truly correct, you see that I put to lowercase. Because someone may put it in as capital C-A-N-B-E-R-R-A. -R -R someone may have all caps locks on and have put in C-A-N-B-E-R-R-A. -R -R -A. So we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to go back to the website. You don't actually have to reload it. It should update on its own because we're running an HTML server which means that it should be updating as we're making the changes. Open that up and now let's see what is the longest in the world by mile? The longest river? No. Is it the longest wall? No. Is it the longest railroad? Yes. Is it the longest finger mail? No. Now again this code doesn't reset those questions back to color. You can also see that I didn't change the color of the text here, right? All it did was insert correct or incorrect before the end of that particular container, right? And then if we go down to what is the capital of Australia? Uh, let's type in Paris incorrect. Let me move this up the screen here. I see we're falling off. You can clearly see I misspelled Paris, but even if I didn't, incorrect again. And now we're going to go back to Canberra. And you see it says correct and then lights up green. Now the submit button stays red. Again, that's a little bit of a coding thing. The goal here was not to show you things like that. It was to show you the different ways to accomplish things. So we have, let's move our terminal down here. This was the second way that we did it, right? So we used buttons. So we have win, win on load, we use some functions. Correct answer is the longest railroad. We have buttons, get element from button, and then we just named the answers button. And we told it that we're listening for a click when it clicks on the right answer that has the longest railroad. If it does have that, it turns it green and says correct. Insert adjacent HTML before end, correct or otherwise incorrect. Then for the second, for the free response here, like I was saying, when you have words in there, you want to bring them all to lower, whether someone's capitalizing or lowercasing things, and check it against the answer that we've told that it is. And then we will change it from green to red. And you can insert additional coding here to change them back to normal. And our buttons were listed here, button class one, two, three. And then in this one, we just have a submit button. And we're checking that answer against Canberra. And we're checking all of these answers, word for word, letter for letter, against the longest railroad to see which one of these is correct. Going back to our first code here. So this was done in 73 lines. And the first code that we showed you was done in 74 lines. So ultimately, the lines work out whichever way that you do it. Again, this one here, we gave it a function to check answers of a button, but the button was get attribute data answer, which you could have named to uh, multiple choice MC answer as long as you updated that further down in the code. And then we have text answer down here, and text answer could have been free answer, whatever it was, but if you called it free answer here, you just want to call it free answer later on in the code. The other things are quite obvious. You can see that you can change the title of the web page from saying trivia to saying welcome to Devon's trivia. You could change the color codes in your CSS here, right? So the CSS is the style file. If you change the background colors of the header, of the containers, you can change the margins, things like that. These are things that you want to play around with because if you end up using this in your final project and your final project is a web developed app, this is going to be extremely helpful to you. You'll probably be doing it in Python, but odds are you'll have some mix of Python, HTML, and most certainly Java to help accomplish what you're trying to do. You should be playing around with these things 
to move things around, change the colors, because what's going to happen is you're going to say, well, what if I change the color of this? And then you refresh your page and that's been updated. You'll start to understand where these things are moving things, uh, setting the parameters of what's the height, the font, the width, the text, things like that. I know a lot of it's gone over in the lecture, but really the value in this week is hands-on learning, which you have an opportunity to do here. So play with the CSS file. There's two ways here in this video to get the index file completed in a way that accomplishes what they're asking you to do in the index file. But HTML here is going to be a great introductory for some of you, a great refresher for some of you, but you should be playing around with these things, looking for various ways to create functions, to create some sort of Java code to put them. Now this is called inline Java code, right? They wanted the Java code inside the script. That's not something that's typically recommended. Most developers would have created a second file outside where if you look at your trivia, it's not on the screen right now, but it's under trivia, you have index.html, readme.md, styles.css. What you actually would have done is you would have created a first one and it would have been uh, script.js or something of that nature and what that's called is an external script and this is what most people are going to use and what you would do to incorporate that is instead of putting the script in line here you'd actually do script source equals and then you'd put the path to your script.js file and script so instead of seeing all this script on the screen here lines and lines and lines of script all of this would be hidden on a second page and you would just point this script to that page and it would run the same code with much more efficiency making this page a lot cleaner and then if you have to go and update that code you go to the other page so you don't have to be interrupted from your code by what's going on in your HTML and see those things separately hope that helps you out week eight's a lot of fun at least the lab is I appreciate you hanging in there with me I appreciate your patience and helping me get this video up on time if you find these helpful please like comment subscribe means the world to me. You mean the world to me. You're amazing. That was week eight. I am Devin. As always, you are awesome. We'll see you soon.